Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 28, September 27th through October 3rd, 1861. Before we really get going, just a quick announcement. The next Patreon episode will be posted here this week, and it is another movie review in The Tall Target, a 1951 film. Very pleasantly surprised with this one, so if you're interested in hearing the review and synopsis, that Patreon link is in the description, and once again... Your contribution to the program would be greatly appreciated. Last week, we checked back in to Missouri and then headed to the Southwest for an update on happenings in that theater of the war. We also mentioned the opening of naval service for escaped former slaves. This week, we will dive back into Western Virginia before covering a few scattered topics. So let's see what is going on with Greenbrier River or Camp Bartow. Remember, not too long ago, Robert E. Lee came out to try and solve the situation in Western Virginia. His first crack at a field command during the war was unsuccessful and essentially sealed the departure of the Western counties to what was then the Old Dominion. Now, was it 100% Robert E. Lee's fault that these sections of the state were lost? Certainly not, right? As we've seen, there's a lot of factors that have gone into the formation of West Virginia. However, uh, Robert E. Lee certainly does not shine like he would in later battles of the war. Joseph Reynolds, who had been the victor of the Battle of Cheat Mountain, decided on October 2nd and October 3rd to attempt to press his advantage against the Confederate forces now laid out against him. Commanding these troops was General Jackson, and no, not Stonewall Jackson. Robert Jackson was a native of Georgia who had seen action at Cheat Mountain. Before the war, he had gained some fame as a poet and a public speaker. During his schooling days, Jackson had actually graduated from Yale before volunteering during the war with Mexico. Jackson had under his command some 1,500 men, including William Tolliver, an interesting figure. While the name is actually pronounced Tolliver, it is spelled Talafiero is one of those Civil War tidbits there. You might see that name and hear Tolliver, and it might not connect there, right? William was born in Virginia to an Anglo-Italian family, which explains the name. He also served in the Mexican-American War before returning to plantations and state government. Tolliver actually commanded Virginia militia troops during John Brown's raid, which we talked about all the way back in the early episodes. After the war, he would become Grand Master of Masons in Virginia. He will also be involved, coming up here fairly shortly, in the Romney Expedition and be one of the officers that bumps heads with Stonewall Jackson, so not his superior in this battle, but certainly coming up there will be some conflict there, and it will lead to some sour relations between the two officers throughout the rest of the war. Also present was Edward Allegheny Johnson, another Virginia native and veteran of the Mexican, American, and Seminole Wars. Johnson had served in the Army for 23 years before resigning his commission to join the Confederacy. He would go on to command a division under Ewell, who we first met during the early engagement at Fairfax Courthouse. 
Johnson would actually receive some blame for not assaulting Culp's Hill at Gettysburg. But that is not until 1863, so we don't have to quite worry about that just yet. He was a bit of a rough character, but also, fun fact, had a reputation as being a ladies' man. Supposedly, a wound he had received in the Mexican-American War caused him to blink uncontrollably, which made women of the time think he was flirting with them. He would earn his nickname in December of 1861, so right around the corner, we're going to find out why he's called Allegheny Johnson. Jackson's Confederates camped along the Greenbrier River in what is now Pocahontas County, West Virginia. Their camp, named Camp Bartow, was approached by the men of Reynolds in the early morning hours of October 3rd. The position was strategic, being located along the Stanton-Parkersburg Turnpike. Union troops under Reynolds would drive the Confederate pickets away before entering the camp. Federals would assault men under Albert Rust, who had been a congressman from Arkansas before commanding the 3rd Arkansas, along with also being a representative for that state in the Confederate Congress. Artillery would soon open up the two sides exchanging fire. Reynolds would send a contingent of Indiana troops to flank the Confederate right, but Jackson had posted two Georgia regiments to block the ford of the Greenbrier River. Reynolds would withdraw from the field after the failed attempt. Overall, casualties were light, although both North and South would exaggerate their claims. Forty men killed or wounded for the Confederates, and around the same number for the Union, would lead to very little in terms of strategic advantage. Both sides would claim victory, but ultimately nothing was gained. Sort of following along in the same sort of path that a lot of these earlier engagements during the war have taken, that any small-scale action is blown out of proportion for their advantages in terms of the press and propaganda purposes, right? So Greenbrier River would definitely fall under that category. Up to this point, we have not talked about camp life in the Civil War. During the campaign season, one out of 30 days could be counted on for combat. How was the rest of the time filled up, though? Drill was constant for soldiers preparing for battle. Entertainment in the form of music and gambling was also common. Gambling, I know, is a little bit of a trickier subject because there were many whose religious convictions would guide them against gambling, so there certainly were many who believed there to be a lot of vice in these Civil War camps, sort of adding into the negative view of things. Some played sports, like baseball, which we know from a previous episode was probably not invented by Abner Doubleday. There are recorded excitements surrounding races and wrestling as well, so other types of sporting events. The Irish Brigade was known for such events during holidays. It is well documented that newspapers and letters from home were valuable. As far as newspapers go, even older issues were shared amongst the men. Writing of letters is an important part of how we understand the motivations of the common soldiers. Many of the common men were literate as opposed to previous times in history. I think it's also interesting and worth noting that even soldiers who were illiterate often found 
comrades who could write letters and could send them home so they would dictate to them their their thoughts their feelings toward their loved ones back at home certainly perhaps it would have killed the time for um, the individual who was writing the letter maybe uh, but it is also interesting to see that they also were able to communicate their thoughts and feelings through these dictated letters as well so we do have not quite as many of those but certainly there are some where we are able to to glean some source material there i'll talk more about food and diet in a later segment but i do think it is important to note that at various times there would be supply issues food had to be foraged and supply especially clothing was short if we think about it, especially for the South, this would make sense. Emphasis was placed on the acquisition of weapons and ammunition so as to fight the war, so clothing would have to take more of a back seat. This is certainly where we get the image of the ragged and shoeless Confederate soldier. Many of the enlisted men would turn toward the securing of clothing and supplies from the battlefield. Here is a quote that describes this action. Nearly all equipment in the Army of Northern Virginia were articles captured from the Yankees. Most of the blankets were those marked U.S., and also the rubber blankets or cloths. The very clothing that the men wore was mostly captured for we were allowed to wear their pants, underclothing, and overcoats. As for myself, I purchased only one hat, one pair of shoes, and one jacket after 1861. So, we see here from this quote that the individual speaking was a uh, combatant in the Army of Northern Virginia, and that last line especially is telling that didn't really have to purchase their own wares, they were able to gain clothing as spoils of war, I suppose we should say. Unfortunately, nearly half a million men would die from the poor sanitary conditions that we have described in previous episodes. Winter camps were part of the cause for this problem. You may have heard the phrase wintering or moving into winter quarters. Road conditions were not so good during winter months, so armies would many times refrain from going out on campaign. And we will see there are some campaigns, especially as we're getting into the colder months here during the winter, and sometimes they are greatly hindered by the weather conditions, by the road conditions that greatly affect the outcome of the campaign itself. A fixed camp would be selected, which meant that the soldiers could build more permanent shelters to protect them from the elements. The dog tents used on campaign, combined with a single blanket, were not as desirable. A wooden cabin with a makeshift chimney would keep the men warm. There are some good photographs of the ingenuity of things that men would come up with for winter quarters. I'll try to post some pictures to the website for examples. If you are not on campaign, I suppose getting photographed was a pretty exciting event that could spice up your week. Supplies could be more plentiful during these winter quarters solely because it solved certain logistical issues. I should also point out, though, that there were usually problems in terms of discarded waste and fresh drinking water, especially if, if the army was fixed in one location for a prolonged period of time. Disease and pests were also common. By now, we highlighted that earlier, so I'll leave it there as just a little reminder. Now I know we have a little bit of a light week, but I would like to just close out 
by going over some inspirations for the war efforts both north and south. We have already talked about the French and Napoleonic influence on tactics, but there are some examples we can turn to and dive even further. Eventually, I would like to have a brief but more in-depth overview of the Mexican-American War. I know we will talk about the service of many of these veterans and battles they fought, but without an outline, I can understand that it could be a little bit confusing. So before we turn the corner to 1862, I will definitely have a segment going over Mexico. I would like to take a look at the conflict that is often overlooked, the Crimean War as well. There were American observers in this conflict that could have learned valuable information that could potentially help in the Civil War. First, let's have an outline of the war and major events. Following the end of Napoleon, you will often hear that the major countries of Europe would be concerned with the balance of power. They did not want to repeat having a country like France become a dominant force and come very near to the conquest of the entirety of Europe. This would actually continue all the way until the First World War. Russia was probably feeling very good following the Napoleonic Age. They had held off Napoleon and participated in the campaigns leading to Paris. Something they always desired, though, was a port that would allow easier access to the rest of the world. They would see an opportunity in exploiting the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, who the Russians would often be at war with. Russia would want to expand and thus upset the rest of Europe. Now you remember when we talked about Napoleon III when speaking of the role of Britain and France in the Civil War. He would also look to restore France to some of its former glory and battle Russia as protector of the Christians within the Ottoman Empire, a move that would see either power gain influence in the East. Russia was not okay with this, especially with Constantinople and the Orthodox faith. They would invade the Balkans, but fighting ended in a stalemate. A naval action that was one-sided for the Russians did make Britain and France uneasy. Russian ships destroyed 11 Turkish vessels with the use of exploding shells, causing public outrage. Still, both of these nations were interested in finding a peaceful solution. When Russia did not agree to terms, then there would be war declared by Britain and France. In July of 1854, the French and British would invade the Crimean Peninsula. This was done despite the fact that Russian forces had actually withdrawn from their advance into Ottoman territory in the Balkans. Located on the Black Sea, if Britain and France were to successfully capture the peninsula, it would damage the Russian naval effectiveness. Supply and logistical issues would plague the Allies early in the war, even with a successful landing. The Battle of Alma would open up with an Allied assault on Russian positions, which forced the defenders to withdraw. The Allies were then able to place the city of Sevastopol under siege. In October, the Russians would assault the British at Balakava. This battle is where we have the famous Charge of the Light Brigade. A miscommunication occurred, which saw British cavalry charge in the wrong direction towards stronger Russian positions. A famous Tennyson poem was written about the charge, which I will read a few lines of, and not just because I memorized the whole thing in sixth grade, well exceeding the minimum of the length of poem I was supposed to memorize. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabers bare, 
flashed as they turned in air, sabering the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the light brigade, noble six hundred. Now the charge itself did not accomplish really anything, despite what Tennyson would have you believe. A third of them were killed in the process. The Battle of Inkerman in November of 1854 was fought mostly in the fog and would see the Russians attempt to break the British siege. The Allies were able to repulse the assault and continue pressing the advantage against the Russians. Tough winter conditions would see many men die from disease. On September 9, 1855, Sevastopol would fall to the Allies, who would be joined by Italian troops. Despite this victory, the public opinion of the war was down, and in 1856, the Treaty of Paris was signed, ending the conflict. 165,000 on the Allied side and 130,000 Russians had died. Any territory gain had to be returned and control of the churches in the Middle East would remain with the Ottomans. In one of those weird twists of historical irony, the Russians would actually go to war with the Ottomans again, this time without interference from Britain or France, and take the territory they were seeking just a couple of years later. Now that we have the rundown complete, I think we can look at inspirations and lessons perhaps learned that would affect the Civil War. British armaments were superior, using weapons with percussion caps, but perhaps the Americans would already have known that from using those weapons against Mexico in the 1840s. So it's obviously on a larger scale, this could have been uh, illustrated further. The importance of logistics and supply would be on display, something we already discussed when talking about interior lines. The British would build a railway to help supply their troops. This focus on the importance of trains to ferry supplies would be a valuable lesson, and certainly one that is seen repetitively during the Civil War. We even have a famous scenario during the war where Confederate troops are actually ferried from the Army of Northern Virginia down to help Braxton Bragg. So while that hasn't actually been used in warfare yet, at least not in the Crimean War, it is certainly an idea and something that is utilized uh, in the 1860s. The Crimean War would see the use of photographs and the telegraph as well. I plan someday on doing a segment on photography during the Civil War, but this was a way to show the public what was going on. The telegraph would speed up communications and be very important during the war, between the states as we already discussed. There would be advances in nursing. The famous Florence Nightingale appeared during the Crimean War. Overall, there were small lessons to be learned that do pop up throughout our story in America. Let's go ahead and pause there. We talked about the Battle of Greenbrier River, as well as had a discussion on camp life during the American Civil War. I'm willing to bet that you did not think you were going to learn about the Crimean War, nor did you anticipate hearing some poetry during this podcast about the Civil War either. Next week, we have a Navy-heavy episode, so if that's something that appeals to you, get excited. If you like what you hear, 
please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link of the website, uh, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. As I said at the top of the show here, support for the general upkeep of what we're doing here and continual improvements toward the quality uh, would be greatly appreciated. Your feedback is welcome as well. Any kind of questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.